Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter number 3. We're going to look at the second part of Peter's sermon this morning. And uh, if we remember last week, we uh, dove into the first part of Peter's sermon. And uh, it started with, chapter 3 started with a, a lame man being healed. And uh, a man who had never walked, a man who had never uh, really even stood on his own, uh, was healed, uh, not by the apostles, not by Peter, not by John, but by the name of Jesus Christ. And, uh, Peter reminded them that the power to heal came not from their holiness, not from their power, but through the holiness and the power of the very name of Jesus. And then Peter outlined their denial of Christ. He, he, he gave them a pointed message. He gave them a message where there was no way they were getting out of the guilt, uh, or, or there was no way they were getting out of the charges that were brought before them. Uh, Peter uh, told them, he reminded them that they had delivered Christ to Pilate, and that they would even denied Christ and his release, even when Pilate said, I find no fault in this man, I'm washing my hands, and yet they still called for the, the release of a murderer. They denied Christ as the Holy One. They denied Christ as the just. Then it's like the nail in the coffin. He said that they killed the Prince of Life. Jesus Christ is the very giver of life. He is where life comes from. There is no life outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the giver. and He is the, the, the creator and sustainer of every single life here on earth. We ended last week where Peter reminded them that God raised Jesus from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if we were to read that chapter, or even uh, the, the first part of Acts, we could read that there were several witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just a few people, right? It was thousands of, of people that, that witnessed Jesus Christ. Though Jesus doesn't need to be defended, right? He doesn't need us to defend him. Peter said this. He, he, he told this to the Jews who were trying to disprove that Jesus truly was God. He said, not only were there all these witnesses, but then he ends, uh, last week we ended with, that they are eyewitnesses of Jesus resurrecting from the dead as well. Some 50 days earlier, uh, probably around 60 days by now, it was the day of Pentecost, where they saw Jesus Christ. Right? He, had, he had risen from the dead for 40 days. He spent time with his disciples. Right, And, and, and then uh, he, would, he ascended into heaven. And they saw him rise from the dead. And they saw his ascension. They were eyewitnesses of the very man that they claimed did not exist. As we looked at the second part of his sermon today, we're going to see that the power that is found in the name of Jesus. We're going to look at the proof that they are no longer ignorant to Jesus and the fact that even the prophets preached Christ. Let's read verse 16 down to the end of the chapter. Acts 3.16 says, In his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want, or I know, I understand that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as 
Many have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. You are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all thy kindred, all thy family uh, of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquity. So let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for this book, and we're thankful for Peter. God, most of all, we're thankful for your Son and the salvation that you offer us freely. God, be with us this morning as we dive into your word. God, hide me behind the cross. Help me to only say the words that you had me to say this morning. Do you say pray? Amen. Amen. The first thing we see this morning is that Peter again reminded them of the power of the name of Jesus. Peter reminded them that their power to heal came from the name of Jesus. It was nothing the apostles had done that made this lame man walk. It was everything to do with the very name of Jesus. They had obviously passed the lame man enough for Peter to tell them that they had seen him. Not only did they see him, it's one thing to see something, right? Uh, we, we see things every day, right? We pass the sun on the highway and we see it. We, we pass a car on the side of the road and we see it, right? But it's another thing to know them. Right? I can see Brother Lewis, but if all I ever do is see Brother Lewis, we're never going to know each other. Right? It took time to get to know him. So he had obviously been there a while. He had been there for some time. And Peter says that you have seen this man and you know this man. And when you see this man, you see that he's, he's lame. And you know this man, you know that he's been lame from the very time he was born. If any of the priests of this temple could have done anything, they would have already done it. Right? If any of the priests had the power to heal this man, I'm sure by now, they would have already, they would have already healed him. But obviously, there was nothing they could do because they weren't plugged into the same power source as the apostles. None of them could do anything like that because why? They trusted their religion and their rules more than they trusted their relationship with the, the, the Messiah. That all of those things that they were trusting and pointed to. What was the point of the law? The law was to point to Jesus. What was the point of the prophets? What was the point of, uh, uh, of the law that was given? All of those things had one, one point. And that was to point to Jesus and their need for Him. But they were trusting more in those things than they were in the one that came to save. Peter says the man's faith in Jesus gave him perfect soundness in their presence. The word soundness means wholeness or entireness. An unbroken, unimpaired, or undecayed state. Literally, his faith made him whole. It made him, uh, it, it took away the brokenness that was in his legs. It took away uh, the, the impaired state of his legs. Jesus had taken his lameness away. This isn't the only time this happened. Think about in uh, Matthew chapter number 9, the lady with the issue of blood. She had the, the issue of blood for 12 years. And, and she had gone to every doctor. She had gone to, to, she, she had gone to every extreme to try to get this issue of blood healed, right? She was diseased. She was sick. And as she made her way through the crowd that day, she knew if she could only touch the hem of Jesus' garment, that she would be healed. And before she could even do that, Jesus turns to her and looks in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 9, 18 and says, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus is the one who heals. None of us. I think if any of us had the power to heal... And we didn't use it to go to every hospital and clear them out. We are, we are doing a disservice. But none of us have that power, do we? Peter reminds them, hey, we're just mouthpieces. May I remind us this morning that we're just mouthpieces of Jesus? We're nothing. We're empty, broken vessels that Jesus Christ has filled and made whole. That's all we are. All of us were born in sin, which means we were born in a decaying state. We were decaying when we were born. Can you believe that? But Jesus makes us into an undecayed state. He can make us whole through the salvation that He freely offers. Peter said, if that's not good enough, He's going to tell them, hey, there's no more excuse for your ignorance. He says that in verse... Number 17, it says, And now, brethren, I, I know, I understand 
that through ignorance you did it. And what is he saying you did? You did all the things that he told them about in the, in the first part of the sermon, right? You, you denied Jesus before Peter. You wouldn't let Jesus go. You chose a murderer over Jesus. You denied the Holy One. You denied the Just One. You killed the Prince of Life. All of those things, though, you did out of ignorance. You say, how in the world were they ignorant? They had the prophets. Right? They, they, they had Jesus Christ, uh, His prophecy foretold for thousands of years. How could they be ignorant? It's because they were ignorant of the Scriptures. The word ignorance here means absence or destitution of knowledge. They knew the Scriptures, but they didn't know the Scriptures. And they had read them thousands of times. Uh, they could tell you everything about them, but they missed that that scripture was fulfilled in the very Jesus Christ. They were ignorant of the scripture. The only explanation for the nation of Israel doing what they did to Jesus is that they were ignorant of the scriptures. Jesus even told of their ignorance from the cross. Then he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says, these guys are ignorant of what they're doing. <laughs> Everything that the prophets foretold of Christ's time on earth was fulfilled. <coughs> Look at verse number 18. It says, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. He didn't just fulfill them a little bit, he fulfilled all of it. Everything from the place that Jesus would be born to the way that he would die and the way that he would rise again and the way he would send to heaven were prophesied in the Old Testament. And they were ignorant of those prophecies. Christ used the prophets in the Old Testament to foretell of the coming judgment, but also of the coming Messiah. And there was always a, a, another message to, the, to the, the, the prophet's word that they were giving they were told where he would be born, how he would live, how he would suffer, and everything they said that would be fulfilled in Jesus' earthly ministry was fulfilled. Think about that. Jesus was literally a fulfillment of history. He was the history book alive. Uh, for the last few days at Chick-fil-A, it's Constitution Week, and so uh, our operator has a, a guy who looks almost exactly like George Washington, and he brought him in. <laughs> He, he was sitting there signing the declaration, or, or he was signing the Constitution for us, and he was telling us stories about uh, how George Washington, and, he, and he, he's really into the whole George Washington thing. He can tell you every fact, all of these different things. He literally almost looks like George Washington. If you were to just walk by and just glimpse over, you would think, man, George Washington is here. Can I remind you this morning that Jesus Christ was the very Jesus that was prophesied? And while this man pretends to be uh, something that we read about in the history book, Jesus Christ was literally the history book fulfilled. I'm thankful this morning that we have uh, that we can look back at the Old Testament and we can see the proofs of the Messiah through the very prophecy that he fulfilled. Acts 26, 22 says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. And they even knew that whatever the prophets said and whatever Moses said was came through Jesus Christ. And nothing more was going to happen. Nothing less was going to happen. What they were told was what exactly happened. First Peter 1.10 says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They prophesied that Jesus was going to come. But unfortunately, Israel was ignorant of those prophecies. You say, what does that have to do with us? I think oftentimes we read about Jesus. We read the very pages of this book. We see, uh, we see the signs of the times everywhere. We see uh, how they lived in the Bible. America and the world is turning that way. We are doing every imaginable evil. We, we live in a world where right is wrong and wrong is right. We have the very scripture that shows us what's going to happen, but sometimes we're willfully ignorant of it. When we think about what we talked about in Sunday school, how, we, how can we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, this is what it's talking about. How can we neglect to tell others about what Jesus has done when we have, uh, we have the signs everywhere that help us to never be willfully ignorant of what the Bible says? 
Everything Jesus did and claimed to be fully kept with the scriptures that foretold of him. I think if Jesus would have come and he would have done more than what the scriptures said, it would have, they would have a little bit of an excuse. If Jesus would have come and did less than what the scriptures said, they would have had a little bit of an excuse. But because Jesus came and fulfilled everything the scriptures said he was going to do, and it was fulfilled in the very person of Jesus Christ, they were without excuse. They were willfully ignorant. They were ignorant of Christ, but they didn't have to be anymore. Peter tells them to repent and be converted. Pretty verse number 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Peter used the word repent also in his first sermon, Acts chapter number 2, right? And he tells them that they need to repent. To repent is, it means a literal turning. They were turning from having faith in their good works, faith in themselves, and turning to where they had a faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they, were, they were no longer caught up in what they were doing, but they were caught up in what Jesus did. He, he told them they needed to turn from themselves and turn towards Jesus. Can I remind you this morning that's the same thing we have to do? We have to turn from believing in ourselves and turn to believing in Jesus Christ. That, that is how we're saved. Acts 2.38 Peter says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, hey, you need to turn. As believers, we have turned from ourselves to Jesus Christ. As non-believers, we are still turned this way, and we must turn the other way. We have to turn toward Jesus Christ. When the Bible talks about being converted, it means you are changing from a state of sin to a state of holiness. Oh, Jesus has changed our state. Right? We are no longer in a state of sin. We're in a state of holiness. Not our own holiness, but the holiness that Jesus Christ brings all of us. When we place our faith in Jesus, He blots out our sin. What does that mean? It means He erases our sin. He, is, he has removed those sins from us. When God looks on us, He sees the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. He no longer sees the laundry list of sins that we've committed in our life. He sees paid in full. Jesus Christ was the very propitiation, the payment in full for our sin. He paid every sin debt. He wrote a blank check on the cross. And that the check will never run out of money. Peter tells him, repent and be converted. This morning we need to be converted as well. We need to turn from our sin and turn to a holy God. We need to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and, and, and turn from our trust in ourselves to a trust in Jesus Christ. When we repent and be converted, it leads to a time of refreshing. The word refreshing here means a time of reviving. When we get saved, Jesus revives us from the dead. We were dead in trespasses and sin, but Jesus Christ has revived us from that day. A new life in Jesus brings a refreshing, uh, a refreshing time to your life. We have refreshment in our life. Jesus was prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15. And he continued to be preached by the prophets. Here they heard Christ preached by Peter and the other apostles. Look at verse number 20. It says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. God sent Jesus Christ to earth. Right? There's, there's an old song that they, I think they've changed the words to now, but it used to say, they searched through heaven to find a Savior. They didn't search through heaven. Jesus Christ was willing to go. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God had prepared the sacrifice even before he created the world. Think about that. God created the world knowing what was going to happen. He knew that he would have to give his son away. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They had heard Christ preached by, the, by Peter and the other apostles. They had heard Christ preached by the prophets. In, peace, in Peter's first sermon, he preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. And now he's going to emphasize the second coming of Christ, as the two angels did, Christ's ascension. Let's look at the prophets preaching. Well, the nation of Israel had not received Christ. In fact, 
They flat out rejected him. Heaven received him. Uh, it, Jesus came to Israel to be to, to be received, right? And instead of receiving him, they rejected him. They hung him on a cross. They put him in someone else's tomb. And they watched him rise from the dead. And while while Israel had rejected him, heaven had received him. We think about when Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven. And God welcomed him back and sat him on the right hand of the throne of God. And he's making, the, he is making intercession for us every day. Jesus is in heaven right now, but there's coming a day when Jesus comes back for the time of restitution. Restitution here means the act of recovering a former state or posture. When God made the world, when God made the earth, He, he, he looked at it and said it was very good. Why? Because it was sinless. There was no sin in the world. Everything was in a perfect state, right? The reason they didn't have rain is because of, of the, the mist that... that uh, that fed the earth, right? And the, the heaven and earth were in a perfect state because sin had not crept in. But there, then sin and the curse of sin came into the earth, and and we can see that the earth is no longer uh, what some would call evolving, right? We, we there's lots of people who believe in evolution, but the world is not evolving. If we look at the the earth from the time when when God created it till now, the earth has devolved. And it's continuing to go that way. We can blame global warming. We can blame climate change. We can blame all of those things. But the reason that any of those things are even talked about is because of sin. But there's coming a day when Jesus is going to change the world back to its former state. Revelation 21.5 says, and he, said, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He's talking about all things. So all in the Bible, uh, in the Greek, the Hebrew, whatever, are Aramaic, whatever language that you find in the Bible, all always means all. It's pretty deep, isn't it? All always means all. He says, I will make all things new. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And God said it. It's true. Revelation 22.3 says, and there shall be no more curse. Amen. Aren't you thankful that the curse of sin will go away? Aren't you thankful that this old body the body that hurts when you get up, and the aches and pains you have, the sickness, the death, all of those things are eventually going to be passed away. God is going to make all things new. He's going to change this old body from a sin-cursed body to a saint body, where we'll no longer have aches and pains. We'll be at the perfect age all the time. We won't have any aches. We won't have any pains. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more hurt. There'll be no more tears. God is going to wipe away all of our tears. There is coming a day when God is going to restore this place to its former glory. The last part of verse 21 talks about the holy prophets, that they had been there from the beginning of time, showing there had been prophets since mankind was around. They looked at Luke 1 7 he says, and as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Even before we read about the prophets in the Bible, there were prophets telling of what God was going to do. Not only did the prophets foretell of the coming of Jesus, Moses foretold of Christ. Verse number 22, when the Bible tells us that Moses. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, The prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all the things which were read. So saying to you, that's a quote from uh, Deuteronomy 18.15 where it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Guess who that prophet is? The prophet's Jesus Christ. There's, God is going to raise up a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall you hearken. You shall listen. You're going to listen to what he has to say. Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19 says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Jesus foretold of the coming judgment as well. God foretold of it. Jesus has always been and will always be the only way to heaven. There's no way around it. From the very beginning of time in Genesis 3.15, uh, till, till God takes us out of this place, Jesus is the only way to heaven. 
There is no other way. There was no different way for the Old Testament than there is for the New Testament. It's always been a faith in Jesus Christ. We think about the Old Testament saints. They looked forward to the cross, right? And that, that's what they were looking forward to. They were looking forward to the coming Messiah. And as New Testament believers, we look back towards the cross as it has already happened. But that is what saved us. Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And we have to place our faith and trust in Him. If you don't hear Jesus and believe in Him, you will be destroyed. That's not my words, though. Don't shoot the messenger. That's what the Bible says. It says, if you don't believe in Jesus, you will be destroyed. What is that destruction? That destruction is hell. It's eternal separation from God. It's, it's, a, it's a fire that never goes out. It is separation from God. All the prophets spake of Jesus... They spoke of His coming, and some even of His second coming. And the nation of Israel missed it because they were ignorant. Look at verse number 24. It says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Uh, the prophets told of what's going on. I think if I had one, one sentence today, if I could only say one thing, it would be a plead for you to not be ignorant of Christ. You can trust Him with your eternity. He's the only one you can trust with your eternity. There's no one else that you can trust with your eternity. We think about the Israelites, oftentimes we find them in their, their plea, their, their, their only source of hope, their only source of blessing comes from the promise that God made them in, in Genesis when he promised blessing on the seed of Abraham. What they failed to realize is why they were blessed, and they still are blessed as God's chosen people, right? If anyone says anything about, different about Israel, they're lying. Israel is always and will always be God's chosen people. And while they were blessed because of that and still are blessed, they aren't saved unless they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing to be saved. Jesus is the only one who can save them. So, Brother Cody, that, that blessing has nothing to do with me. Yeah, it kind of does. Think about us. Just because your family is saved doesn't mean you are. Just because your grandma and grandpa went to church doesn't mean you're saved. Just because your mom and dad went to church and brought you with them does not mean you're saved. Just as you've grown up in church your entire life does not mean you're saved. While the Israelites often claim this blessing as their salvation, oftentimes Christians claim their heritage as their blessing, as their salvation. But there's only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Yeah. God sent Jesus to take away our iniquities. What does the word iniquities mean? It means a sin or crime, wickedness, any act of injustice. All of us have been wicked. All of us have committed a sin. All of us have done those things, and God sent His Son to take those things away. We see the result of the preaching. Acts 4, verse 1 through 4, it says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came in, upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in, in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. You know, what was the result of the preaching? Number one, they made the, the priests and the Sadducees upset. They, they preached the resurrection, and that did not sit well with the priests and the Sadducees. The Bible says they were grieved. The word grieves mean they were greatly disturbed. Why? Because they knew it was true. They were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit instead of yielding to that conviction. Instead of placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what did they do? They threw them in jail. They put their hands on them and they held them overnight in jail. But that didn't stop the message from being heard. As a result of Peter's preaching and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, around 5,000 souls got saved that day. It, was not a, it wasn't a, 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 the best message it wasn't the most easy to hear message either. Peter had called all of those people out. And yet 5,000 souls serve us in wine because the Holy Spirit doesn't need us. Doesn't need our message. 
He needs us to be yielded to Him so that He can use us. Conclusion this morning, the nation of Israel missed out on Jesus because they were ignorant of the Scriptures. Let's not be ignorant of the Scriptures. Don't miss out on Jesus because of something that you don't, that you say you didn't know. Just as Peter preached, if you're still here, you can get saved. And if you're still alive and well, you can get saved. Then Jesus Christ still wants to blot your sins out. He wants to erase them. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today is the day. There is no other moment. We can show you this morning from the Bible how you can be saved. Let's all stand and reverse invitation. Father God, we're thankful for the word that you've given us, God, your holy word. God, we pray for this invitation. Now bless it. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that today that we come and get it settled. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.